Economic efficiency. Just what is economic efficiency? Well, let's start out with what it is not. It is not. Uh, it doesn't mean fair distribution of income. It doesn't mean safe neighborhoods or other social goals. I put fair in quotations there because uh, ask 100 people what is fair and you're going to get 100 different answers. Okay. Uh, markets cannot solve every problem. Nobody's saying it can, but there are many tasks best left to markets. Interfering with markets often leads to unintended and undesired consequences, as we have already seen. It can cause unemployment, can cause a shortage of housing. And uh, so you mess with the market, and it, it often makes things much worse. And uh, something else that we're going to hit on in this, uh, in, in this lecture is it lowers standard of living. It, it means less is produced in many cases. And that's the case, at least with price ceilings, which is often the, the, the type of price control we see implemented. So moving along. What is efficiency? Well, if, if market efficiency doesn't mean that everybody has enough to eat, doesn't mean there's safe neighborhoods necessarily, no pollution, you know, all that, a host of social goals, a good social goals, what the heck does it mean? Well, what it means, when we talk about economic efficiency, we're talking about Pareto efficiency. After Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, who came up with this concept, we're talking about his efficiency. Okay. Uh, market is Pareto efficient It is Pareto efficient if one person cannot be made better off without another person being made worse off. Okay, think about this. First of all, let's take a look at the production possibilities curve. Here's good Y, here's good X. If we're sitting inside the production possibilities curve, it's possible to have more of X and more of Y. We could go along here and have more of both. Okay, however, if we're sitting on the curve, the only way we can get more of X is to have less of y. We can only move from this point to this point by having less y. We can only get more x by having less y, for example. That's efficient. That's Pareto efficient. Inside the curve is not. So we want to be on the curve. The only way to help someone is to make someone else worse off. That means we're at maximum output. Another way to look at uh, efficiency is equilibrium right there market equilibrium is Pareto efficient so let's see why that's what we're gonna look at we're gonna look at it this way with uh, using supply and demand curves and uh, we're going to apply we're now going to use the concept of economic surplus as our measure of uh, efficiency. Okay, here we go. Let's um, Okay, there we go. There's the market for Twinkies, the uh, food of the gods, as we all know. And uh, here we see that the equilibrium is right here. Equilibrium price is 10. Equilibrium quantity is 20, so anybody willing and able to pay 10 bucks can get a Twinkie. 
No shortages, no surplus. Okay. Well, let's suppose that a new, new research finds that anybody who eats Twinkies um, adds 10 years to their lives. Okay, this is becoming an important social health issue. And they want everybody to have uh, access to Twinkies. So, they pass a, a law that sets the price at $8. They want Twinkies to be affordable for everybody. Well, what's going to happen? Well, this is a price ceiling. Well, at $8, suppliers are only going to produce this much. Now, of course, this much will be the quantity of demand that's clear out here. So let's put in a couple of numbers there. Let's say there's 15. Quantity demanded is now 25. So yeah, there's a big time shortage of Twinkies. But the, big, the thing I want to point out here is how this is not Pareto efficient. Okay, at 15, uh, excuse me, at $8, at $8, 15 Twinkies will be produced, and that's, that's it. There's 15 Twinkies being produced. Before the price ceiling, there were 20 being produced. There's less available. The, the attempt to make this thing affordable for everybody actually reduces standard of living. When we say standard of living, I mean, look, we had a standard of living that included 20 units, now it's only 15, okay? Less stuff means lower standard of living. Also note at a price of eight, uh, at 15 units, a buyer is willing to pay 12. That 15th unit, someone's willing to pay 12 bucks, but it can't happen. The supplier is willing to produce it at eight and does, produces 15 units, but that, uh, let, so, so we've got uh, buyers wanting to pay more than sellers are, are need to produce it. Well, Let's go with the 16th unit. The 16th unit will not be produced. So the 16th unit will t tell you, uh, it, and if it were produced, we'd have more economic surplus. 16th unit, um, the firm is willing to produce that if they can get $9 for it. And a consumer is willing to buy it for 11. So a producer is willing to produce it for nine, and a consumer is willing to, to buy it for 11. If that 16th unit were produced, both consumer and producer would be made better off. See, what would happen is, uh, in this case, if, if it were equilibrium, I mean, any price between 9 and 11 would work, but let's go back to our equilibrium price. In that case, there's producer surplus, the difference between the price, again, we're just assuming 10 here, the difference between the price and the reservation price of the firm is one buck. There's one buck of producer surplus to be had by producing that 16th Twinkie. So they're better off. Consumers willing to pay 11 bucks, they only have to pay 10. There's a dollar 
of consumer surplus that would be had, okay, if that 16th unit were produced. So you can make both producer and consumer better off by producing that 16th Twinkie. They would both be better off. Thus, since we're able to make people better off without making anyone worse off by producing that 16th Twinkie, this level of production, 15, is not Pareto efficient. There's some consumer surplus, there's some producer surplus that's available that won't happen because of the price control. The $8 price control here prevents this 16th unit from taking place. In fact, it, it, it prevents the uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th units from taking place. It's not till we get to 20 units where we're Pareto efficient. At that point, the only way any change can take place from 20 units, the only way to make anyone better off is to make someone else worse off. Okay. Uh, for example, if we did uh, the 21st unit, the 21st unit, well, there's a... Well, let me just use the red here. We've got uh, the consumer is willing to pay this much, and if they could get it for this much, they'd be better off. But that's not going to happen because the firm needs this much. So if that 21st unit took place, yeah, consumers would be made better off at the producer's expense. So you're, you're, you're making someone better off uh, and making someone else worse off if we produce that 21st unit. So 20, here at 20, uh, is where we need to be. So going back to this uh, 16th transaction, now here, here's, here's the main point. Transaction, because of the price control of $8, the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, and 20th units are not produced. There's a lot of economic surplus in there. That's just the, the, there's the difference between the, these two transactions. Well, let me, let me write that in. There's this distance of economic surplus, this distance, this distance, this distance, this. All that doesn't exist. Those are transactions. Those are economic. That's consumer and producer surplus that is available that would be a benefit to both consumers and uh, producers that aren't going to take place, are not, because of this $8 price ceiling. So we stop there at 15 and the benefits to, to consumers and producers for those other transactions are gone. This is precisely why efficiency should be our first goal, okay? Yeah, with efficiency, we get 20, we have a higher standard of living, okay? Here's the thing, bottom line. You can't redistribute wealth that isn't created, okay? With price controls, it isn't created. Here we've got this. Without price controls, we've got this. So we've got a greater, greater wealth, a, a, a higher uh, standard of living. So we've got to create the wealth first before we can alter its distribution. Price controls will keep it from being created. So we've got other social goals, that is for sure. We have goals of helping the poor. Uh, you know, we want people to have basic necessities, for sure. And uh, there are people out there who can't afford the equilibrium price. Maybe they can, you know, they can afford the eight, but they can't afford the 10. So 
are there other ways of, of helping? And yes, there are. But the first goal is the, the goods have to be produced. And then we can figure out ways of getting it to people who can't afford it. The economic pie will shrink with this price ceiling. We don't want a shrinking economic pie. Everybody gets a, a, you know, a shrinking pie, again, means lower standard of living. We need maximum efficiency uh, because that best enables us to reach other social goals. Because greater economic surplus means less waste. That's the thing. Here, here we've got all this lost economic surplus. That is waste. It's like you took a bunch of cash and burned it. And we, in fact, we call this dead weight loss. That's our dead weight loss. Lost economic surplus. So with less waste, we have more resources. We need uh, those resources to do what we want to do with other social goals, whatever they may be. Okay, let's do another numerical example. And um, we'll calculate the consumer surplus, the producer surplus, and the deadweight loss. Here we go. Let's say this is, oh, I don't know, home heating oil. Something like that. Getting tired of talking about Twinkies, so am I. So, here's the price, equal, okay, here we go, price quantity, here's the equilibrium price, it's $1.40, let's say, per unit, whatever the units are. And up here, that's two bucks, down here is 80 cents. Um, well, I don't have that uh, time out. Okay, there we have our supply curve fixed. And uh, the equilibrium quantity is uh, 3,000, 3,000 units. Okay, well, let's first uh, calculate the consumer and produce a surplus. So we've got uh, what we want, whoops, what we want is this area, okay? The difference between what uh, consumers are willing to pay and what they actually have to pay. So it's this, this, okay, all this. So we just want to find the area of that triangle. Okay, so we've got this distance times this distance times a half. So $2 minus $1.40 is 0.6. And then times that by 3,000, which is you know, this distance, Let's see here, and times a half, okay, or divide by two, whatever. And that gives us 900. So we have $900 worth of consumer surplus. And I should have done another one. I should have chosen, again, I chose different numbers where they end up the same. And uh, again, that, that is not necessarily going to be the case, but I, for whatever reason, did that here. So um, now we want producer surplus. That's the difference between the reservation, well, the actual price minus the firm's reservation price. So we want, you know, all this difference here. And um, we will calculate the area of this triangle. So $1.40 minus 0.8 is uh, this distance. And that is 0.6, again, times the 3,000 
which is, again, this distance. And we get, and then times a half, and then equals, that's 900 bucks. So total economic surplus is... I'm trying to squeeze it. Okay, I can't squeeze it in there. Um, total economic surplus is eighteen hundred bucks. Okay, easy enough. Now, it's determined that well-meaning government officials, uh, you know, there, there's always good intention here. All, always lots of good intentions. But like I've said before, we, we're not that interested in intent. We, uh, we're interested in outcomes. So, we're going to cap the price at a dollar. Here's our price ceiling at a buck. At one dollar now, and as we saw with the uh, California electric uh, <laughs> shortage, uh, producers will produce less. It's not economically uh, feasible to, to produce what they produced at a dollar forty because they incur higher costs and um, now they're only going to produce a thousand units. So there's just not enough, or excuse me, there's just not the, the, as much home uh, heating capability now. It's more affordable, but there's less of it. So at um, 1,000 units, we want to calculate now the consumer surplus and the producer surplus and the dead weight loss. Okay, well, let me choose a totally different color. A thousand units will be produced. That's what this is the uh, amount that consumers are willing to pay for that thousandth unit. Let's say that is a um, dollar eighty. Let's first figure out the dead weight loss, actually. Um, that would be, again, this area here. Okay, here is, here is, um, because these units from 1,000 to 3,000 are not being produced, we've got consumer surplus, the difference between here and here, not being realized, not being, no benefits there, here and here, here and here, here and here. So we've got consumer surplus, lost consumer surplus of this area right here. And we've got lost producer surplus of that, this area right here. Now we can calculate it in parts, the, the lost producer surplus, this area, and add it to the lost consumer surplus, this area, or we need to do it in one chunk. So let's just do it in one chunk. That's, all, that's what we really care about is, is what's the total uh, loss. So this is the dead weight loss, this area right here. So we want to know the area of this triangle. So it's this distance, $1.80 minus a $1. dollar. is 80 cents, and then this distance here, whoops, that distance, the height of the triangle, it's a sideways triangle, so 1,000 to 3,000, that is uh, 2,000, and then times a half, okay, and that gives us 800. 
So $800 of waste, of lost economic surplus. Again, it's called dead weight loss. Think of it as taking $800 and throwing it in the fire. Boof, it's gone. Okay, you're burning cash here by not allowing these units to be produced. Now let's pr calculate the uh, produce a surplus. With the price control. So the producer surplus now is the difference between the actual price they're receiving, which is one dollar, minus their reservation price given to us by the supply curve. So they're selling it for a buck, they're willing to, to sell it for this much. This unit they're, they're selling for a buck, they're willing to sell it for this much. So it's this, this triangle right here. Okay. There's our producer surplus. So let's uh, calculate um, the, this area. Would be this distance times this distance. So this times this times a half, okay? So we've got dollar minus 0.8 is 0.2, and times a thousand times a half equals hundred bucks. Now the consumer surplus. Well, the consumer surplus is a little bit trickier. Uh, we've got to, uh, let me pick a different color. We have to find that, we have to do this in two parts. Because what we're after, okay, this is the consumer surplus. Here's the price being paid down here. Consumer surplus is the distance between what the consumer uh, or the difference between what the consumer is willing to pay and what they actually have to pay. So the reservation price or the amount the consumer is willing to pay is up here, up given by the demand curve. So for this unit here, it's this distance, the difference. So what we want is this area. And we're going to have to do that in two parts. Here we have a triangle, and here we have a, a rectangle. So we've got to figure out the areas of each of those and add them together. So let's see what color do I have here. This is the consumer surplus, that area. And we're going to do it in two parts. This, we're going to get that triangle, then we're going to get this rectangle. Okay, the triangle. Two bucks minus one eighty, that's point two. Times a thousand times a half. Okay. So that little part of it is a hundred. And then the area of the rectangle here, not re yeah, rectangle, is uh, this distance, you know, area of a rectangle is just base times height, the length times width, with, you know, we don't do the times a half, because we've got, you know, we split that in two, and we've got two rectangles, but we don't want two rectangles, we want, uh, or two, we got two triangles, sorry, <laughs> and then we, we just want this, so it's just this distance times this distance, so it's dollar eighty minus a dollar, point eight, times a thousand. So equals eight hundred. So we have nine hundred total consumer surplus. So the issue, the big the big the big story here is that our economy is 
worse off overall by 800 bucks. We used to have 3,000 units of this good. Now we have 1,000 units. There's less. There's a smaller economic pie. So here before, here's our economic pie before. It was $1,800. That was the total economic surplus without the price control. Now the total economic surplus is 1,000, a smaller economic pie. Obviously, we can do a lot more as a society if we're creating this much of this size of economic pie than this size of economic pie. And this is precisely why socialist economies are poor. That is the unifying characteristic. They're great at producing poverty. So we, we, we can obviously do a lot more with this than with this. And a lot of those countries, you've got uh, not just a smaller economic pie, but a, an extremely smaller economic pie. An economic pie so small that people are, are having a hard time, uh, you know, they're having a hard time producing enough food to eat. And uh, there's lots of uh, examples in history. Uh, Poland, for example, almost starved to death after World War II. They, they, they finally converted to markets. And, uh, you know, uh, Germany, same thing after. <laughs> they, they, uh, there's a great uh, PBS documentary called Commanding Heights, how the, how the economies around the world uh, moved over to a more market-based and uh, just, just mainly because of, of necessity. Uh, they were uh, not producing a big enough pie to survive. So that, that's basically why. The inefficiencies, the inefficiencies, the, the, the uh, lost, the deadweight loss from those economies uh, produce poverty. And there it is. Just imagine a pie and imagine this pie. Which one is better? So... Uh, you can use this pie to accomplish other social goals. Now, now here, here is uh, you, you might say, well, look, uh, people were are too poor in this example to pay the dollar forty. They need a lower price they can afford. Well, you know what? A more a much more efficient uh, way to do this is to just give these people the cash instead of blowing up the market give them the difference if you want to help people don't destroy the market by having output go from 3000 down to 1000 give them the cash they need to make up the difference and one source of cash just saying in this example would be a lump sum tax Ask yourselves here, what, what is, how much would producers be, how much, okay, first of all, how much are producers, what is the producer surplus? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I don't even remember. Let's go back up here. The producer surplus before was $900. That's what it's worth to them to participate in this market. That's how much they would pay to be, okay, think of this, think of the, think of the, the um, example I gave in the previous lecture uh, of, a, of a flea market, okay? There's a building. You've got to pay to get in the building to do business. How much would they be willing to pay to get inside that building to, to do business? Well, they'd be willing to pay up to, up to $900. Now, think of it this way. How much would they pay, would be willing to pay, what's the maximum they'd be willing to pay to not have the price control? To not have the price control. Well, producer surplus was 900 before the price control. After the price control, producer surplus is 100. 
that's a difference of 800 bucks. They'd be willing to pay up to $800 not to have the price control. So, you know, I'm not necessarily advocating this. That's the best solution, but it's a solution. Give a lump sum tax to the producer of somewhere upwards and maximum maxing out at 800 bucks. That's how much they're willing to pay not to have the price control. Say, hey, we're going to put a price control on, but we'll, we'll uh, give you a lump sum tax of, say, $700. Which are they going to choose? Oh, yeah, well, we'll, we'll pay the 700 bucks not to have the price control. So if it's a lump sum tax, it won't affect output. And um, then you can give the people uh, who need help buying the gas. That would be a source. So... That's one example of how allowing the market to reach equilibrium using economic efficiency as our first goal as a way to uh, help people another way rather than a price control.